Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. Look, we got a bunch of people requesting the millennial farmer to be on the show. We got Zach Johnson on tonight, and uh, there is no better time in our nation's history than to have somebody who's an actual real live farmer in the farmer industry, or the farming industry, I should say, Why is that? Uh, than today. Look, man, we've got a, we got a pandemic going on. Mm. Um, the, the factories uh, are getting shut down. Tyson was a big one. Um, yeah, but the uh, War Powers Act, War Production Act, is going to be used to keep those bitches open. I- exactly. And, and I want to learn more about that today. That is something that yeah. we're, we're hearing about a lot in the press. We're hearing about it from both sides of the aisle. We don't know any, any of the people who were actually in the middle of it. So that's why we have Zach Johnson mm-hmm. uh, today on the show to, to discuss it. Uh, Zach, first of all, how are you, man? Let's, let's go into a brief history of, um, uh, of who you are and where you came from. You have a massive YouTube channel about farming. How did that happen? Yeah. Uh, kind of a little bit by accident. I guess I started it as a, a hobby to try to relate to people a little more about what goes on with the family farms in America that we still have out here. Cause a lot of people have an idea of what's going on, but they really don't, they don't have a way to actually get inside and see what's happening day to day on the farm. So that's why I started the whole thing. And it's just kind of snowballed from there. It's just been taken off and, and going faster and faster all the time. The next thing you know, I'm, I'm on the drinking brothers. <laughs> I love, I love when people use our formal name, the drinking brothers. <laughs> we are, we are brothers today. We're drinking white claw. We're very brothers today. I usually, I feel the urge to put on a tuxedo <laughs> when somebody calls us yeah. the drinking brothers. You yeah. should. You maybe, should. You got a gold kill cliff chain. I do. Stuff. Yeah. Maybe I'll start wearing a tuxedo everywhere with a gold kill cliff chain around my neck. I mean, who's <laughs> going to fucking stop me? Nah, not, not during this. There's, like you said shit. before the show, there's no police out anywhere. I was, I, I actually saw one on the way over here. I was sitting at a stoplight and, uh, was, uh, fucking around on my phone and, uh, looked over and there's a cop sitting there right next to me, yeah. which I think that's illegal. I don't know if you're stopped at a traffic light, if that's still illegal or not. Yeah, it's illegal. Uh, yeah. But I'm just fucking around phone. on my phone and he looks over or I'd look over and he's looking at me. I'm like, and I just go back to fucking around on my phone. It's confidence, right? Yes. If you walk around like you are supposed to be somewhere, usually people will just think that you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Right. So that's what I do most of the time. Yeah. That's what you should be. doing. I show to a lot of children's birthday parties. Yep. Because I like cake. Right. Yeah. But I'm not I don't have kids and, no. I don't, and I don't like people. So there's not a whole lot of opportunities to eat cake outside of the home. You right. can go to a restaurant and order cake for the most part. You can't. They you, don't have it. On no, there. you get desserts, but not like cake. I just not, want some cake. fucking sheet cake. Yeah. So I go to a lot of children's birthday parties. A lot. Um, and good thing Zach lives in Minnesota. So you're nowhere near Dan Holloway <laughs> and he can be nowhere near your wife and kids. So you don't have to worry. And I am that, so Zach. thankful for that. Yeah, you should be. You should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you look, the, the fascinating thing about you is, is not only do you have a, a massive YouTube channel, you've been able to make farming in, like interesting and relatable to people. Um, and that is the biggest hurdle, I think, because it's like, man, uh, h- how do you make it interesting and relatable to people? Is that something you guys discuss before you're shooting these things? No, none of it's ever discussed. I mean, I, I literally throw the camera in my work jacket pocket when I go to work every day or rides around in the lunchbox or whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't plan anything ahead of time. It just is what it is. And there's those days where, you know, I don't want to take the damn camera out because I'm annoyed because something's broke down or something's gone to hell and, and everybody's in a bad mood and you don't want to take that camera out. But, uh, some, sometimes some of that stuff is the most interesting, right? People want to see that the reality of what it is, because it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Yeah, I, it's not. Um, and it's interesting to hear you say that, that you're like, man, I, I don't really want to be filmed. But I think, especially for the farming industry today, it needs something sexy. Like, you need YouTube. You need people that want to want to be in, in farming. Um, because right now, that is not a job that is pitched uh, at your elementary schools and high schools and things like that, where it's like, you know what you should be? A farmer. Right. Right. I don't think that's been a job that's been pitched for, I don't know, like 140 years, it seems. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, uh, let me ask you this. Have you ever had like spirits or apparitions show up and try to convince you to plow all this shit and build a baseball field? Yes or no? Every day. See, <laughs> fucking told you. It's not drugs. Are yeah. you on drugs? I mean, I'm on drugs. So I say stuff. People are like, oh, you're just on drugs. But I think that 
It's I just think that's true. Kevin Costner is out there somewhere, and it's got to be him, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, what's it like trying to farm in Minnesota, by the way? You know, we're we're in the upper upper Midwest, obviously, so it's the upper end of the Corn Belt here. But uh, it gets better and better all the time. There's a lot of science and tech out there that has helped us be able to grow a lot of pretty good crops for being this far north. The guys down in the in in God's country, we'd call it down in Illinois and Iowa, where they've been able to raise really good corn for 100 years. I don't think some of those guys believe us, but we can come up with some pretty good corn up here. But obviously, it's the weather all the time. You know, I mean, the the weather affects you guys because you got to deal with it on the way to work and whatever and, and it can it can screw shit up but like for us it, it it literally controls my life i mean we had rain last night that's what makes it convenient for me to be able to sit here and talk to you guys otherwise i got to be in a tractor because we're we're only two full-time guys here between my dad and myself handling about 2700 acres so wow i mean I, we got to keep moving we don't we don't sit down when it's go time Man, uh, 2,700 acres, that's crazy. <laughs> Describe a, a day in the life of, of your job. What time do you typically get up? What do you do? And then what time do you typically end? I, it, that varies so much depending on the time of year and the weather and the conditions and what exactly we're trying to do. But, I mean, most of the time, even when we're busy, you know, we try to start stuff, try and get out of the house around, you know, between 6 and 7 o'clock a.m. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. I... I we don't have livestock to feed in the morning, so it isn't it isn't that big a deal for the guys with livestock. Some of those guys are, are up at three o'clock in the morning feeding cows and doing what they got to do. But like our time of year, if we're going at six a.m., uh, we'll go until you know eleven o'clock or midnight if we have to. If things are rushed at all, I mean, we'll go twenty four hours if we have to. It just totally depends on the weather and the conditions and what's going on. Whew. Well, I mean, the typical Minnesota winter is about eight goddamn months long. Maybe longer. Yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah. no, it's like in, in the Twin Cities, it's about eight. You, you get about seven to eight solid months of actual winter there. It fucking sucks, dude. Man. It's the worst. I don't know how all those goddamn Somalis exist up there. I don't either. I, I would have left years ago. Yeah, and it, so if, if you're saying your dad did it <laughs> um, and you're working with your father, obviously he's had these farms then probably for forever. Yeah. It's fifth generation, right? That's I believe that's fifth. what I read. Yeah, I'm fifth generation. So my great great grandpa brought the family over from Sweden in the 1870s, and so a lot of the stuff we farm today is still the exact same stuff we were farming 150 years ago. Imagine that a Scandinavian tooling around in Minnesota. Yeah, who would have guessed? Shocking, crazy, yeah. isn't it? Ufta. You still use that farmer's almanac? Uh, no, no. Now it's just farmers only. <laughs> mm. Is that how you met your wife? Yeah, that's how I've met all my friends. <laughs> It'd be amazing if that was true. Where is she from? She's she's got a an accent. Well, she's from not too far up the road. She's got a, a thicker Minnesota accent than I do. I don't know how that happens, but she's from she's from an hour up the road from me. Got it. Yeah, I, I don't either because it it it's a full on like yo yeah. It seems like she's from Scandinavia as well. Which 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 road up which road? That's very vague. Uh, Where is she? Is she Canadian? What's going on here? Yeah, which road what are we mean, talking about? H- Highway seventy one. Western well, Minnesota. You guys don't know it? Oh, actually, you know what? I do know it. I, I know it. I do know 71. So 71 goes yeah. down all the length of the country through Columbus all the way down to Texas. Yeah, probably. I, once it gets to the Minnesota border, I don't follow it anymore. Have you ever left Minnesota? <laughs> Come on. I, I have left Minnesota, yes. Right, At least man. that's what they tell me. <laughs> yeah, you never know. It could all be Minnesota. Iowa, for example, doesn't exist. We've established that. Yeah, on the show. Iowa. I, I yeah, was. A I've state heard that about that. Exist. Yeah, yeah, Iowa's not a real place, and I, I I've been there, so I know. Yeah, I, yeah I and I. Yeah. I don't really know where the plane's at when I get off. It just, I just assume it's where they tell me it what is. If, so what if? What the hell knows, right? What if we've been lied to this whole time, and the entire United States is only like this big? It probably is. You know what I mean? It's like some kind of weird Hunger Games thing. I've been to 42 states. I've never been to Minnesota, so I don't know that it exists. I've, I've never been, been to I've, the D- Dakotas either. I've been to all. I've been to every state except for Alaska and Hawaii. Okay, so you'd be 48 out of 50. You got me by. Uh, you got me by six. But I'm still not sure that they all exist. I mean, look, there's so much weird shit in our water supply. They, they're not weird shit in the water supply. There's, there's so many opportunities for people to do weird shit to our water supply, whether it be through bottled water or tap water, right? Mm-hmm. That they could easily drug and trick us, I feel like. Uh, Dan, on the drug part, 
you're correct. Uh, as you're smoking weed currently, uh, I would say that this is <laughs> this is vitamin C. You've bro. definitely gone into to high talk at this point. Was there Zach? Was there any thought of calling up your your grandfather, your great grandfather, and saying, "Hey, man, why did you start this in Minnesota? If you were going to be a farmer, <laughs> why did you start this in Minnesota? Why couldn't we have gone to a southern state?" Yeah, I would love to ask them that. I don't I don't know what the answer is to that, but I they kind of fucked up. Yeah, what did your dad say? Like your dad had to have been like, "Yeah, man, I mean, I guess, you know, it's here, we're here, so we had to stay here." <laughs> well, that's kind of the thing, right? You're kind of stuck where you're at when you got a farm. You just kind of you, you are where you are. You deal with the circumstances. It could be worse, right? Yeah, look, it it, it always can be worse. Um clearly. Yeah. Um you know, we always go back to Anne Frank on that one. Like yep. it can always <clears throat> be worse. Uh, for you personally, though, um, how how is it affecting you uh, as far as COVID nineteen goes in uh, in your crop or crops? I, I should say. Yeah, well, right now, I mean, honestly, like where we're at with what we're doing, we are so rural out here that there really hasn't been much that's shut down that's affected us much, other than Good. I gotta I gotta just get carry out for my beer from the bar rather than be able to go in. Mm-hmm. I mean, there it's not. It, it really hasn't changed that much as far as that goes. Obviously, we got to plant the crops. We got to get the field ready. So we're doing what we have to do. And, and there's nobody here to tell us we can't or no, nobody's trying to tell us that we can't. Right. So um, our our farm personally, we really haven't changed that much. I haven't adjusted that much other than just some of the people you deal with, whether you're buying parts or or the inputs that you need for the crop. You, you just try and keep your distance. Everybody's just trying to be smart about it. But nothing's shut down here. The ones that are really getting pounded right now are the livestock guys and then the ethanol industry, which in turn in the future is going to come around and affect us pretty big. Um, our corn price has already taken a big hit on the market as far as what we can sell our product for. But uh, I think we're going to see a lot bigger hit on that because we're killing the end users when it comes to the ethanol and the livestock industries. And those are the guys that have it hard right now. Yeah, and explain that to me because like, the big controversy this week was obviously the the Tyson uh, chicken thing um, and everybody went out here uh, everywhere and bought up all the chicken from the stores uh, Trump said he was what he was going to reopen he's he's going to use the uh, war production act to keep uh, meat processing plants open yes yeah but I don't he didn't I don't know if he referred specifically to Tyson because there was a pork one that shut down recently too um, okay but yeah he can he, that's well within the executive branch's power to do that yeah so explain to the audience why this is a big deal because look full disclosure dan and i know nothing about farming um we are endlessly fascinated by you and what you do we know nothing about this subject whatsoever Uh, so describe to the audience what is going on and why this is a big deal that these meat plants mm -hmm. are getting shut down (laughs) so around us we got pork plants that have shut down Mm -hmm. uh there's jbs and smithfield those are some massive pork processing facilities that have essentially shut down one of them had a pretty large outbreak of covid uh that was in in south dakota what happens then is is that the the infrastructure of how this meat gets to market is set up so efficiently i mean it is everything from you know ground zero till that stuff is in the grocery store is set up to be so efficient to operate exactly how it should when everything is running normally right Mm -hmm. well people go out and panic people get sick you shut down a couple of plants you got people that don't want to show up to work because they're scared of getting this virus and it throws a wrench into the whole system. And now what we've got is specifically, I, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk hogs here for a second because the, the hogs are the pig farmers that I know. I talked to them for quite a while yesterday and the situation they've got is they've got pigs that are ready to go to market that should be getting slaughtered and sent to the grocery store right now. And these processing facilities can't take them. And it's a, mm. it's a, it's a little bit complicated. There's several reasons why. Number one is because they've got some of these plants shut down. So they've already taken stuff out of production, so they can't handle as many hogs as what they're set up to, to take. But yet the farmers are sitting there with the pigs that they thought they were going to be able to get rid of, and now they can't. So now they've got barns that are full. they got places that they can't go with them, and they got they got hogs coming up behind them that are supposed to fill those barns once once the finishing barns are empty. So you've got a situation where they can't hardly give the pigs away and the processing plants can't take them, yet the pork that you guys are seeing in the grocery stores is more expensive and harder to come by. And we've got, we've got producers out here that might have to make some pretty tough decisions and literally end up euthanizing or killing some of the hogs that were ready to go to market because they don't have a place to go with them. 
Got and yet it. the grocery store shelves are empty. This So this makes more sense. So I, I got a, a message from a, a Drinking Bro listener who said, hey, man, um, can I have your address? I want to send you uh, this cow, essentially, mm -hmm. um, you know, packaged and, and, and ship it out to you. And I was like, uh, sure, that's, a, that's an odd request, but, mm -hmm. you know, we'll take the meat, obviously. And he goes, great, because I would hate to see it go to waste. So... And that was the end of the, the the message, and I, you know, I gave him our address and all that stuff. But um, uh, is that what he's talking about when he says go to waste? They're, they'll just have to euthanize well, the animals. Did you not see? So, uh, um, I I don't know if it was from the Tyson, but uh, there's an article in the New York Times this week about two million chickens had were just killed and not processed mm -hmm. because of this whole shit. Like exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, well, I, for me, the hardest time i'm having i guess during this whole pandemic is i don't trust the news anyways mm -hmm. um because I, I feel like it's driving some agenda so i don't know whether any of this is true or not that's it's why having a guy like zach on today is important where it's like is this this is really happening so like this article in the new york times that, that dan just mm -hmm. referenced that is really happening to farmers around the country that is really happening because they don't have a place to go with this with this with these animals right it's just and it's crazy. So they've put all this money and time into these animals and these animals get to the, to the end where it's time for them to go to the market mm -hmm. and there is no market and we can't come up with one. I mean, and the thing is too, that like the hog producer that I talked to yesterday, they are the perfect definition of a family farm, which there's not many of those left when it comes to, to a lot of things, livestock, but specifically poultry and hogs and they own all their own pigs. But when, when you think of a family farm, I'm not talking the old dude in a straw hat with a horse and an old cabless tractor. I mean, these guys own 100, 100 or 150,000 hogs that they house over, you know, dozens of buildings that they're paying people to maintain the buildings and keep the hogs going. Mm -hmm. But it is a family farm. It's him and his brother and his dad that run this operation. And, and now they've got these hogs that need to go to market and they can't give them away. And the options are, you know, you either feed them a maintenance ration, so you're feeding them every single day. And in the end, your market price on those is going to go down anyway because the market wants them when they want them. If you keep them around, that animal gets older and it gets bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the quality of that meat goes down. They're not going to be willing to pay as much for it. Not only that, but you got way more into the animal. So right now they're losing $20, $25 per hog if Oof. they can get it to market. If they can't get it to market, obviously everything they had into that animal is a complete loss. And, and they may have to face a tough decision of getting rid of, you know, they it potentially they could have to get rid of a hundred thousand animals that essentially are gone. Wow. Uh, so is Donald Trump doing the right thing in this instance? I, I don't want to say that he's doing the wrong thing. I, I don't think he's doing the wrong thing, but I, I think he's doing some tough talking, you know, because the fact is a lot of those facilities first off are, are they may opt to not be open and then it's going to be tough to find workers getting the workers into those facilities right now those workers don't want to want to come to work when there's this huge risk of covid right and you got all these people standing in those facilities shoulder to shoulder getting the work done so they're struggling to find labor so i think i mean yeah you want to keep the facilities open and keep them moving so we can get rid of as many animals as we can but at the same time like is that going to happen? I, I I don't know. I think it's a really difficult situation. It's just it's another thing coming from COVID that we just have never seen before. Yeah, and to, and to that point, I think you know overall for every industry, mm -hmm. it's not what's <laughs> happening right now currently. Yeah, it's the downstream. It's second. it's about three months, three to four months from now, mm -hmm. if if things don't get back up and going, uh, in a safe manner. Because it's like you said, yeah, you don't you also don't want to put workers in unsafe conditions. Um, right. But on the flip side, how much of your business has to suffer uh, in order for that to happen? It's a really, really tough call. And, you know, I don't think our economy, I don't think it's going to show in our economy for about three or four months. And, and then I think we're in real trouble. Um, I'm not sure what else can be done about it. But um, well, like he said, I mean, I and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like because of how efficient the system is, once people are actually back to work and comfortable working, I don't think, I think it'll be, the turnaround will be immediate. You think so? Here, yeah. Here's, here's something you might be missing on that though, is if we, if we go through this downturn for too long, there's a lot of these farms that are going to be number one, they could be totally gone, right? Because they just can't sustain for Bankrupts? very long. I mean, if you got a, yeah, yeah. you got a family farm that's got to, 
uh, euthanize a hundred thousand hogs, they're, they they could be done. They could be out of business, and they'll they'll be eaten up by the big guys. I'm not saying there isn't going to be pork because the big guys will always move in, and if there's a market, they'll they'll make sure they create a product. But but you're killing the family farms if if they can't sustain through it. And then the other thing is with livestock and with crops. You know, at least the crops that I deal with, you can't just flip the switch and have more pork tomorrow. I mean, you've got to set up for that. It takes months to decide how many pigs you're going to have at the point it's time to market them, right? Or whether that be, you know, beef with, with the cattle or poultry mm. or like in my situation, we get one chance a year to have one crop. If, if that's messed up, we got to wait a whole nother year before we've got an opportunity to hopefully make adjustments on that. And, you, and to be clear, you're not going to have this problem, right? For, for your farm and your crops? Well, no, because we don't have livestock, but, but the thing that makes me personally nervous that would affect our farm directly would be when if those hog producers go out of business mm -hmm. or even if they don't go out of business we just go down to a, a 70 percent supply of what we had for hogs we're they're only taking 70 percent of the feed that they used to take which is a huge hit to my market so if 30 percent of of that hog feed market is gone you know there's not as much competition for my product and then we're doing that with hogs we're doing it with cattle we're doing it with poultry i mean it's all affected because that's where my product goes and my product also goes to ethanol uh, you know which is gasoline running in the cars well right now we've seen close to a 50 percent reduction in the amount of of oil being used or gasoline being burned in the cars on the road yep that's coming back and killing the ethanol industry and that's another hit now so we're down to half the ethanol production we were all of my end users are, are having their throats cut during this situation and eventually, long enough term, that's going to come back on me because we're going to have way too much of the product that I grow. Yeah, I feel like that's the solution, though. You got to make sure that uh, end users, even if you follow it all the way downstream to the customer that puts the product in play, right? Mm -hmm. Those people need to have money right now. Like if there are processing plants that are getting shut down, then they need to be bailed out for the time being. Right. Because like you said, if there's an interruption in the supply chain, and like you said, there's going to be like this accordion effect down the road. Mm -hmm where everything just gets fucked. So I, I feel like we should operate at every level possible as is, or not as is, but as we normally would, and let that you know just kind of work its way through the system and keep everything moving forward. Like there's a book called Traction. It's about marketing and, uh, and doing startup businesses, but the idea is essentially that um, it takes a lot of energy to get a wheel rolling, but once it's rolling, it takes way less to keep it rolling. But if it stops, it takes a lot more energy to get it rolling again. Mm -hmm. And you want to avoid that second scenario. So if we can, even if it costs us a lot of money now, just to keep pushing the ball down the road, as long as everything's in motion when we get back to normal, I think we can get back to absolute normal pretty fast. Yeah, and again, this is why it's so fascinating to have someone like you on the show today is I would, I'd ne I would never have thought about that, um, the ethanol or the gasoline or, or, or any of that stuff in a million years, right? You think about farms, you think about crops, or you think about, uh, like you were talking about, pigs and cattle mm -hmm. and all that other stuff. You don't really think about, oh, well, shit, ethanol, yes. Such, it's so basic, but most of us Americans um, don't think about that. And we know it happens. We know there are farmers out there. Um, but we do not understand or, I think, respect how much we rely on farmers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in this country Um how catastrophic would it be if this continues on this path? What would what would the day to day life be if if most of these farms and in, in, uh, in industries go out of business on your side? I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I mean, that that'd be something, you know, again, unprecedented that we haven't seen before. But I, I think if this continues very long, there will be some of that. You know, you will see some of the smaller farms that are are going to have to be you know driven out of business essentially they will be driven out of business it, it, they will they will disappear and like anything else uh typically what's going to happen is as long as there's a market at all you know somebody who's sustained through that is going to come in and gobble them up and the, the yep. big will get bigger and and the small will go away i mean it's the it's the evolution of the industry like <laughs> any other industry right it's just at, at some point with capitalism it, it works that way with everything yeah, like Disney, for example. Yeah. Who owns everything now. But I mean, it doesn't. Disney is an entertainment company. Like, yeah, entertainment's great. And if there are, uh, you know, if there are companies that come close to mon monopolies and shit like that, it is what it is. We'll break them up and whatever the fuck. But when it happens in 
medicine, we see big pharma who mm-hmm. has been butt fucking us for a hundred years now. Yeah. And if it ha- if we let it happen, if we let these family farms die, then there's going to be rampant corruption and price fixing on a scale that's even larger than it is now with these corporate farms. Right. So it's like keeping everybody wants to talk about bailout this and that people have different opinions on it, but it's not about like there are people, this, this dude works probably harder than anybody that's listening to the show right mm-hmm. now. Uh, or at least commensurate with, and, and it's, it's like, no, no one's asking you to do anything crazy. It's just like, Hey, this needs to continue to exist. Otherwise we're fucked. So right. maybe let's do something about that. Have you been approached Zach by like a bigger company to buy you out over the years? Not with not with what we do with with corn and soybean up here. You haven't seen a lot of that, but again, it, it once again comes back to the livestock industry with the consolidation in that industry. Um, there there are the bigger companies do want to own their own animals, so that they have uh, the control with what the animals eat, how they're housed, how they're taken care of. You know, they want to have the animal welfare, everything in place. They they just they want the control from beginning to end because they're under such a microscope. So these big companies, you know, they like anybody they're apt to just trust themselves more than anybody else so they want to own the animals at the same time it does take a lot of pressure and a lot of risk off the private farmers if somebody else owns the animals so if if i'm you know i could call myself a pig farmer but you could walk into my barn that i own on my property and none of those pigs would be mine you know they'd be owned by one of the big companies by the end user that's eventually going to slaughter those animals and they're just renting the space from me and i'm maintaining the building and and taking a pay cut on that and so that's kind of how a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of it works. And in, in what I do with corn and soybean, it, it just seems to me like the big companies, I don't think they're interested in owning real estate. They don't want to come out here and own farmland. So their form of control, I think, or, or getting their teeth a little bit into controlling us is through different technologies that we use. And, and maybe by wanting us to use, you know, certain seeds and chemicals and, and by con- trying to maybe control pieces of the, the chain of inputs that we have to use that we have to have to grow these crops and that's how they control us without having their risk into the real estate you know but that way they keep it on us Mm. to own the real estate and and own the farmland which is what we want anyway we don't want to give that up of course uh that's the second time you've used the phrase inputs tell me what that means well when i use inputs i guess what i'm talking about with 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 my farm would be fertilizer Mm -hmm. seed chemicals the cost of doing business, Okay. you know, so what are the things that I need to grow this crop? Got it. Got it. Um, and and with that, what's the allure in becoming a farmer today? If you're, if your father, if your father wasn't in it, is this, is this a job that you would have said, Hey man, uh, yeah, I definitely want to be a farmer because from everything that you're saying, uh, and then, uh, you know, just all the articles I've read over the years about how they're constantly screwing over the farmer and the, and family farms and everything else. What is to make people want to get up and do this every day? You know, it's a very unique lifestyle, right? Uh, So the people around me, the people I know, the people I affiliate with, I mean, we're used to it. We take it for granted. But when I talk to guys that are not involved in agriculture and I hear from them, how unique this is, what I do. I mean, they're excited to hear about what it is I do because when I get up in the morning, I get to head out on my family's farm and I can look for a half mile in every direction. Mm-hmm. And that's our land. That's our property. We've got privacy out here. You know, the kids run around all day in the yard when COVID hit. Yeah, sure. We're even if we want to quarantine to our own property here, the kids are out riding four wheelers and dirt bikes and the bicycles and my boys out on a four wheeler trapping gophers all day long. I mean, I don't see him from morning till night if, if he's out finding gophers to trap and just, you know, as cliche as it sounds, in all honesty, just the way of life and raising a family out here, I don't know where else I would want to be. Um, and I think to that point, you know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom and make it sound like like everything's falling apart out here. I do think that with this COVID situation, if we have a big reset, that there there's some real opportunity here where potentially there will be a lot of people that can come out and have the opportunity to do something for themselves out here to recreate the small family farms again, because I, I just think, you know, if, if everything restructures out here, people are going to have to get creative to stay in business. And I think people will start hitting on some of the niche markets that a lot of consumers like to see right or wrong, whether the farmers agree with it or not, somebody can come out and, and hit those markets. And I think 
it could potentially open a lot of doors where where you don't have to be a big farmer to make a profit. You come out here and be creative and you want to work hard, you can make something of yourself. L look at what Bert's doing out in Wyoming right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible place. Nobody should go out there. But <laughs> How much money did Bert Coons pay you to say that? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, but I'll, I'll expect a check anyway. But, you know, look at you. You can go out there and you can do that stuff. And, and he decided he wanted to do that. And he's out there making it happen. And I think opportunities like that are not gone. And I do think that there could be some opportunities like that that come up because we don't know where this whole thing is headed. No, you're right. And it's, it's an interesting uh, outlook on it because I, I've been reading numerous articles that are, you know, people fleeing New York and California mm -hmm. and uh, people are going more rural, if you will, mm -hmm. um, looking to get away in case something like this were to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, e even my wife has said, man, it'd be great to have acres instead of being confined yeah. to, to this space <laughs> in a neighborhood where, you know, it really is affecting you and it's affecting your neighbors and your neighborhoods. So people are choosing sides, whether or not, you know, uh, stay away from me or stay to six feet, uh, you know, keep the quarantine going. Uh, Clay Crawford, who's an actor friend of ours, mm -hmm. who's always on the show, he has a farm in Alabama and, you know, he would go and shoot movies and then come back to his farm. It's a fully operating farm and all that stuff. It's not on the, the scale of yours. It's, it's a smaller farm, but... When I talked to him last week and I said, hey, man, how, how are you doing? How are you holding up? Mm -hmm. um, he just had a, his first grandchild. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Bubba, I've been quarantined uh, for life. Like, I'm, this is no yeah, know, different right? than my day-to-day -day life. And I'm, I'm assuming it's the same way for you, Zach. Where you woke up and you're reading the news. You're like, man, I can't believe that's going on in the world. But it is definitely not affecting me this morning. Yeah, we, we joke about that around here, that farmers have, have been social distancing for 150 years. It's nothing new to us. <laughs> well, you know, farmers also have, they also see more UFOs and get abducted by aliens more frequently than any other group of people. It's true. So be careful is all I'm saying. Unless you're an alien that's replicant, that's replaced the actual human being we're supposed to be talking to, in which case, welcome to our Earth. Yeah, have you, <laughs> well, have you seen anything strange out there? Uh, no, no. I, but at first, I want to say, you know, what kind of an alien is going to come to this planet and decide to hang out with a dude that's wearing wearing a gold chain around his neck and hanging out at birthday parties when he doesn't even have kids? Yeah, <laughs> there it is. The Kill Cliff necklace. Right. They're going to come out here and hang Relax, out, with us. dude. No, yes. they, they're, they're going to want to fucking party, man. No. And that's what I want. Right? I want space drugs. Right now, I'm done yeah. with this Earth drug bullshit. I yeah, want space you want, drugs. You want space drugs? No, they're going out to the farmland, man. They're gonna, they want to ease into this way of life. They, you can't just hop into a Dan. You've got to no, hop into no. a Zach first and, yeah. and try to figure out what, what's going on down here. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, it's, it takes a lot of time and effort to be comfortable around a guy like Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the degenerate aliens that would befriend us? Oh, God. That would make me immediately <laughs> suspicious of them. I think, Dan, if anyone was to have an alien best friend, it would probably be you. They wouldn't say a lot. They'd want to do drugs all day and then watch all your weird shit that you watch. Well, I'm Rick from Rick and Morty, right? I Pretty mean, much. essentially the human being. I'm, I'm like a mix between Rick and uh, Ron Swanson. Ron Swanson, yeah. 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 So it's like, of course they would want to hang out with me. <laughs> Why wouldn't they? <laughs> hey, Zach, obviously you, you, you listen to the show. This, we got some sponsors who pay for this whole shit wagon to be on the air. Um, so you're going to have to sit through them, and we're going to ask you about them. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, I know how it goes. Yeah, so first and foremost, talking about ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. You got a ghost bed out there in Minnesota? I don't. I wish I would have had one last night. Oh, you can't look. You can. You can get one now. It's 25% off. Wait, why Everything last night? What happened last night? Off. Yeah, what, what happened last night? Did you guys get down? Were you, uh, you and the missus get down? We, well, I... I don't know how I'm supposed to answer that. Plowing on yes. a ghost bed. Yeah, you can say the word plowing. <laughs> yeah, right? plowing. Very, because very it's, farmer. Because you're a farmer guy. Yeah. Get it? You're right. And it was just a standard old disgusting mattress. You know, it was nothing like you guys are talking about here. Oof! If Rich Bernstein is listening, send 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 Zach a ghost bed from ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. <laughs> Rich is our guy over at Ghost Bed. Uh, he's been hooking people up with like free giveaways mm -hmm. and shit like that. Give Zach a call. Give him a, give him a free ghost bed. As always, 36-month pay-as-you-go program at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. 25% of everything, and they're, they're going to do this for the rest of uh, the quarantine. So, mm. um, <laughs> you know, they don't typically do sales like this. They do it around Christmas and the yeah, holidays for usual. people. They, they, they do that. 
Shit, yeah, I think that's it. Really. Yeah. July 4th, and then they do Q, Q4 holiday yeah, sales. Yeah, exactly, right? um, which a lot of companies do, but uh, they've been really cool about it, so they're, they're doing 25% off until this is over at, at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros, and killcliffcbd.com. Uh, has also been doing this. They're giving 30% off, 30, yep. uh, with the promo code Drinking Bros. Um, I actually think they're about to change that back to 20 soon. So Are they? Get on it now. Yeah. Buy soon. Uh, look, you get a case of Kill Cliff. It's got 25 milligrams of CBD in every single can. If you are stuck inside with your children and don't have access to a farm like Zach does, where the kids can run around and play all day, you're in close quarters. Nothing will make you happier than a can of Kill Cliff. Uh, CBD to, to really calm your nerves on uh, the nights where your children are asking to play Connect Four for the 90th time. No, tomorrow. no, um, no. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's going down. No. And as always, you will not piss hot. Uh, there's no THC in these cans. So uh, you're, you're good to go on this. Um, it's, it's not one of those drinks that you're like, eh, is this coming from China? Can I trust it? Yes, you can trust it. You're, you're good to go on this. Uh, 25 milligrams of CBD in every single can. Grape. Mango and orange. Uh, get a case shipped to your house. 30% off. Uh, you get free shipping too. Promo code Drinking Bros at KillCliffCBD.com. Last but not least, and this will this will be a perfect segue in, uh, into our next question is about FarmersOnly.com. Mm-hmm. We've got Buy Roman. Is it Get Roman? Get it's Roman. Get Roman. Uh, dot com forward slash Drinking Bros. It's the boner pill, Zach. Uh, now that's, y- I'm, I'm sure you're using, you know? You're a young dude. Yeah, Maybe otherwise, you know. uh, otherwise, last night couldn't have happened. That's true. Mm-hmm. It really couldn't have. Well, I mean, things can happen and they can happen. Like really you know happen, yeah. Like <laughs> Wesley Snipes can show up to your party or like, I don't know, Post Malone can show up to your party. Both famous. Yeah. Right? But one's clearly better than the other. I, I would say Post Malone in this situation. Yes, obviously, yes, in every yes. situation. I've, I've been to a party with Wesley Snipes, though. I'm Maybe sure it's, it's fun. It's not fun. Not because fun, he's actually. the best guy ever. <laughs> yeah, he's fucking weird, man, in real life. But uh, uh, either way, it's because uh, he's a vampire. I think. Yeah. Look, if you're yeah, uh, Rossi, you'd hate to you'd hate to hang out with somebody who's weird in real life. Yeah, right? ex- exactly. Jesus yeah, the Christ. guy with uh, a bunch of face tattoos and I know, right? Like six million dollars worth of guns <laughs> is not the weird guy. I know. <laughs> in that situation, it's oddly Wesley Snipes. So you're yeah. like, yeah, that's the fucking weird guy. Um, at GetRoman.com forward slash Drinking Bros. You can get discreet boner pills sent to you in the mail. No fucking doctors. Uh, you don't have to worry about a, a doctor in that. It's online. Uh, let's face it. They're, they're asking you not to go to doctors anyways. Everybody's going to have quarantine babies after this. And uh, you might as well saddle up. Because at this point, you've tried every sexual position you could possibly dream mm. of. Go to GetRoman.com forward slash Drinking Bros. And uh, have some boner pill shit. There's, there's a couple of positions that you really can't do unless you're hard all the way to the tip, my yes, man. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, you need all three and a half you edges. Need every <laughs> last centimeter of that <laughs> cock. Go to GetRoman.com forward slash Drinking Bros today. Discreet packaging. No, no one will know. Your mistress, your kids, your wife, nothing. Yeah, your dad, grandfather. Let's get into some hardcore farmers questions. Is the FarmersOnly.com <laughs> legit? Is that a real thing? Have you or your friends used it? And how did you meet your wife? <laughs> as far as I know, nobody that I know has used Farmers Only. But it's a like it's a running joke around us. How in the hell this company stays in business and what it is? I mean, who's who starts a company dedicated to pinpointing like 1.3 percent of the population, <laughs> and then of of that percentage, you're really trying to pinpoint the ones who are either not married or trying to get away with something, right? So yeah, you're talking about a pretty small group of people here that you're trying to get to. I, it doesn't I know, make there's sense. Like, there's to like me. twelve farmers left. That's what I don't understand. They it, built it, a whole website for it, but their Come ads on. are running nonstop, like yeah. on big, big shit, like the, like the NFL. And it's like, how are you paying for that advertising for FarmersOnly.com? I think maybe it's a social experiment that somebody's spending their money, like Bloomberg or somebody's spending money on. You think so? Maybe, yeah. Because I've I've never heard of anyone actually using that site before. Have you seen their commercials, Zach? Yeah, they, I mean, they. I think they had a Super Bowl commercial a yeah, couple yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're out there in the audience, if you've ever used FarmersOnly.com, put in up. the YouTube comments what happened and how the site was and stuff. Because I'm super curious. Now. Yeah, we're curious too. Um, but but how how does how, like how did you meet your wife for real? Like when you live on 2,700 acres, you guys go to college together, high school. Like, how, how, what's that like meeting somebody? I, well, I met her at uh, actually I met her at a party, so she would have been she didn't go to my school, 
she went to a different high school, but uh, I think it was after, must've been senior year actually. So we were both in high school yet, but we were at a party out some farmhouse, you know, that's how we do it out here. Somebody, somebody's got it. a farmhouse that's sitting empty and you get, you got mm -hmm. electrical power to the place and you, that's where everybody goes for Friday, Saturday nights. And that's you, where I met her at. Those are called uh, I, hoot nannies, I believe. Yeah. I'm mistaken. <laughs> in the South. What? I don't know about in Minnesota. Yeah. What do they call them in Minnesota? Uh, down South they are called hoot nannies, if you will. I have no idea what that is. We just call it the, whatever the old farmhouse on the fucking road where we all get wasted. Sure. But See, like, that's a lot more syllables than hoot nanny, though. That's you got to be more efficient. You're a yeah, farmer for Christ's sake, dude. You got to be efficient. Let's let's come up. Yeah, with but a the name northern northern farmers can handle syllables. That when that's you say true. when you say they can handle syllables, you're implying that southerners can't, right? <laughs> you said it, not me. I'm just following your logic chain. Uh, we've got a couple of southerners in the room here. We do. I think a plow house. I think you should call it a plow yeah, a plow house. house. That's it. Just make a bar and a barn called plow house. Yep. And there's glory holes in the back and shit. I mean, you could do it. <laughs> and and one of those like isn't a real dick. It's just some form of cattle where it's just like, oh hey, wh what's behind this glory it, hole? It starts at small. Yeah. Uh, or XS and then small, medium, large, large, extra large, and then. There's just a picture of a horse. Yeah, and it's and, like, hey, do you want the horse or not? Yeah. want the and horse. And then obviously on the extra small side, probably an Asian. Yeah, probably an Asian guy. Yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah. And even though you know there's a chance of getting a horse, you're gonna you're gonna work with every one of those holes just because they're there, right? Well, you spin yeah, a wheel. I to. think you spin a wheel like Wheel of Fortune. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then it's wah wah, and like if you get the big one, obviously you don't want to deal with that. You can die. Yeah, you could. So, <laughs> you know. But you spun the wheel, so you get what you're, you're asking for. You yeah. get what you get. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's it's a dangerous game, my man. It always is, isn't yeah. it? Always is. Uh, the milking table is what I'm I'm curious about. Yeah, I think. Uh, is that a big thing in the farming yeah. up there? Do you milk milking tables? Mil no, I don't know what you're talking about. A milking, milking table, table in oh. porn, and I know you've seen it before, so let's just skip past that part where you're pretending <laughs> like you haven't seen it. But once once I describe it, you'll you'll admit to have seen it. I hope otherwise you're a liar. So, <laughs> uh, it's basically a uh, massage table with mm. a hole cut out in the middle, so you can stick your dick through and get it sucked from underneath the table. Correct. Yeah. Well, uh, every farm's got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. They do. Right. I mean, Is that if where you it came from, if you don't have that, then I feel like you're fucking up. Yeah. Is that where it, <laughs> is that where it came from? By the way, the milking table is that something that that's at every farm? No, there's no table where you milk <laughs> Hang on. animals. As far as I know, this there is no such table like that. No. Damn it, man. I thought for sure <laughs> no. there was a milking, like, that's where it came from. No, it's just creeps. Or does that come from porn? Just yeah. creeps, yeah. I like that. How many people were in your high school? Oh, in the total school? Uh, well, we had, let's see, we had six grades in the school when I was there. Yikes. It's gone down that's now. as high as it went. I mean, huh? it, I was. <laughs> huh? I said that's as high as it went. Huh? You're, you're talking about you're talking about all that shit. To, uh, <laughs> how you guys are comfortable all, with syllables. all the way to sixth grade? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know who else had a sixth grade education? Jethro Bodine for the Beverly Hillbillies. He did callback. Yeah. Nailed it. Also, his dad was a, bo a boxer. Ah, look at that. There you go. Good for him. So everybody can get fucked. So how many people were in the in the school? You you if there were six grades in it, jeez. Yeah. I, it was it was around a hundred people per grade when I graduated there, and it's gotten considerably smaller now. Wow, so you're you're down to little house numbers, like little house on the prairie and shit. Yeah, I mean, I it it doesn't, you know, I didn't know any different at the time, but yeah, I, there's uh, we're I mean, we're not too far from population. We're a hundred miles from Minneapolis, and we're a hundred miles from uh, Fargo, North Dakota, which is pretty good size. But okay. but yeah, I mean, it's it's nice. It's a nice nice size. Uh, let's, let's clean up the myth about, uh, farmers having sex with, with animals. Is that a thing? Uh, no, that as far as I know, there were rumors in high school of one dude and a ah, horse I knew it. and that's the only, but, but the, isn't there always a rumor of one dude and a horse in high school? <laughs> Look, every, every good high school will have a janitor who has some kind of physical defect. That's mm -hmm. also a suspected pedophile. Every single high school in America has yes. one of those guys. Yes. And, uh, that's. I mean, goals, right? Who is the guy? I think guy? you got to have that on the application <laughs> if you're going to be a janitor. You got to have like a fucking milky eye or one leg. <laughs> one leg is longer than the other one or some shit, right? <laughs> Who was the guy? Did he have like a like an old man, you know, oh, that's old man Richardson. Like, don't go down there. He fucks horses. No, this was a student. 
Really? Oh, well, that that actually yeah, probably yeah, it's happened. Even better. That probably happened. That happened. Then. If it was a student, yeah. it probably happened. If it was an old man, like kids are cruel. They make fun of older people a lot, especially lower wage workers and shit like that. But they also make fun of each other a lot. But I feel like nobody just makes up a story about our producer Alec having sex with a with a dog, for example. Yeah, nobody makes that up. Like nobody would say that <laughs> Alec definitely had sex with a dog. Yeah, he's a young man. Nobody's no one would say, Oh yeah, Alec had sex with a dog. No one would say that. How old was this kid and what was the animal he was accused of fucking? I mean, was his name Alec and was well, the animal a dog? <laughs> uh, yeah, so his name was Alec and he had a dog. <laughs> 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 Speaking of Alec and dogs, he's you, you've given a very famous person a, a nickname, so you should be really Spice proud of Dog. That. Yeah, we had Sean Spicer on hashtag the other day. Spice Dog on uh, Sean hashtag. M Spicer Instagram. Yeah, get him. We gave him the, the Spice Dog nickname. Who? What was the animal for this guy? What was yeah. his story? Uh, the 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 story was it was a horse, and it, so he had to he had to use the step stool obviously because a horse. I mean, it's a full size horse, right? If you've ever tried to fuck <laughs> one, you know you got to get up on something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we've all tried. Yeah, we've all we've all had these thoughts, right? You got to or we yeah, yeah, head, we've but. at least whiteboarded it, right? Yeah. Like if I was going to do it, it would be a <laughs> Here's the thing though, a step stool like I it would be a Shetland pony. Is that that's you still got to be a tall guy. Was he a tall guy? Yeah, he was a taller guy if I'm remembering correctly. Wow. Yeah. Went robotic there. Yeah, right I, li- I like that a lot. So I'm getting all boned up maybe, over here. Yeah, but you you might be right. Maybe it was a short horse. Horse. It could be a short horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're a tall guy, you got to go for a short horse. What's he doing now? Tall guy, short horse. That's a good name. For what happened with his video. life? Was he able to recuperate and like get back in the game? I have no idea. I, could, I don't think I've seen the guy since I graduated. It's been over 15 years since I've seen that guy. That's funny. The reason, the reason I ask, we Do all we... have one of those guys in our high school, oh, right? Yeah, you yeah. had one. I had one. I, you don't know what it does to somebody. <laughs> First of all, if it's not true. I found it because there was a kid in our high school who one of my friends went all in on Mm -hmm. one time and made up this story. And I didn't know if it was made up or not. I didn't find out until afterwards. He he developed a a nickname that was uh, unfair uh, and prohibited him from having sex in high school with Mm -hmm. other with women. And one night we were at a bar and I ran into him and I'm housed. Right. And I, I was with the friend who made up this story or whatever. And I was like, hey, man. There's that guy. Did that really? Ha- and it was six years later, six years after high school. And I go, did that really happen? And he goes, no, nah, I kind of made it up. You know, my buddy was trash. And I go, dude, I think you should go apologize to him at this bar. Right. So he walks across the bar and sits down with this guy, has an hour long conversation. I look over. He's crying. He's telling this kid that he's sorry or whatever. The other kid starts crying. It turned out none of it was true. And then six years later, this kid apologized, and, uh, and and he got his life back together from it. That's a real sad story. It, it is. But, like, I wonder. <laughs> that's why I always ask. Did this guy ever recuperate? And, like, did, did people know? And did anybody ever say, hey, man, I'm really sorry about blaming you for fucking that horse? I, I couldn't even tell you. I, I have no idea. But, <laughs> I, man, apologizing to a guy six years later that story that sounds too uncomfortable to really do i mean i think i just let him deal with the emotional trauma uh, there so we that go I have to fucking to these these emotionally pent up yeah. uh fucking uh scandinavian minnesotans yeah they're like oh <laughs> a, they just like don't talk for 10 years and you their, guys are fine with to it. their parents yeah. you know <laughs> what i mean anyone yeah yeah it's, it's ridiculous <laughs> they're the most uh passive aggressive people on earth nor are uh, Scandinavians, but particularly Norwegians, actually. Is that true? Yes, it is true. You don't have to fucking I, I think, ask him. Yeah, if, yeah. There's a lot of us here in Minnesota, and that is definitely true. And when, it drives me up a wall. When you have arguments with your wife, will you just go days without talking to each other? Ah, uh, that that's pretty rare. That's a pretty big argument if that happens. Okay. But so I know there. I mean, I got buddies that'll do that. Like they have an argument with their wife, and for two weeks they're both just you know harboring anger. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let's get into the Minnesota Vikings then. Um, is every person from Minnesota a Vikings fan? Is that true? No, there's a lot of Packers fans, right? Really? Yeah, there, there's some messed up Packers fans around. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, so fun fun fact, if you get up into northwest Minnesota, you're up into the area where Carson Wentz came from. Yep. Yeah. So he was playing up there for the Bison. Ooh. So there's a lot of Eagles fans up there, which gets real weird when you, when you look at the uh, championship game where they completely smoked us. And so some of us, 
some of the Vikings fans really hold a, a grudge against the Eagles. And then you got the Northwestern guys that are diehard Eagles fans. And then you go to the other corner, you got the Packers fans there. And obviously you just got the, the rivalry there between the Packers and Vikings. So it gets a little cloudy. Yeah. That I, I remember that year for you guys. Like it, I thought everything was lining up. You had that, the Minnesota miracle uh, that passed to Stefan Diggs. That was a miracle yeah. over the saints and the Super Bowl was being played in your city. I thought for sure the Vikings were going to the Super Bowl and going to win that year. That had to have been just soul crushing. Didn't for the you. Eagles win that year? Yeah, yeah. the Eagles won. Yeah. It was Big Dick Nick. That's right. Yeah, yeah thanks for Patriots. reminding me of that, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, look, now they've got Cousins, Cook, uh, Adam Thielen, and Justin Jefferson. If they don't win, if they if they don't make if they don't win a playoff game this year, that is a huge disappointment with that lineup. Well, they won. They, look, they won a playoff game last year. Yeah, um, and then they got smoked by the 49ers. Yeah, but... well, that was a yeah. They were just on a roll. Second yeah. half of the season, they were they were all fucking uphill or downhill, I guess. Like they were, they had so much momentum behind them. I I don't know. Kirk Cousins had that one good playoff game, and everybody was like, "You can't say he's not good to playoffs anymore." And then the next game is like, Bang. "Yeah, are you a Kirk Cousins fan? Do you believe in him?" I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just one of those guys. I'm not going to be a bandwagon guy, and I hate running down my team. I think, I think Kurt's a good dude. He seems like a real, genuine good dude, and I think he wants to win. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a Kirk Cousins fan as long as he's wearing purple. Mm. Seems like a good guy, you know. But I was a huge Case Keenum fan when he was here, for the way, the way he pulled that team to where we were, and watching him do the, the skull chant, you know, when we're sitting there ready to, to, put that game to an end, and. I mean, I was a huge Keenum fan. I, I wish we'd have kept him, but I understand it is what it is. So whoever's wearing that jersey, I'll back him up. Well, look, historically speaking, uh, the Packers now, for the second time in our generation, have drafted a quarterback while their quarterback, who's among the best in the league, is at his age 36 a year. Yeah. Which means if everything goes as planned, you'll have Aaron Rodgers in two years. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll see what happens, right? By the way, that Favre year you guys had with uh, the Vikings, that was that was one of the funnest seasons ever, yeah, man. I wanted him I wanted you guys to win the Super Bowl so fucking bad. <laughs> he was one bad throw away and I, I think he would have made the Super Bowl. That was one of the funnest teams I've ever I've ever seen. It was. It was a blast. And then you go all the way, way back to uh, 98 when Gary Anderson missed the field goal. Oh. We've had our souls crushed in that championship game I think 5 times in my life. Gary yeah. Anderson fucked you over once too, didn't he? Uh, no. So Gary Anderson was the one that got the Falcons to the Super Bowl, and I was—I couldn't yeah. believe he missed that kick. What in two thousand one? No, it was nineteen ninety-eight. We were oh, in the ninety-nine Super right, yeah. Bowl. Dirty birds. And then one of our uh, best defensive players slept with a prostitute. <laughs> then and he got arrested for it the night before the Super Bowl, and we got crushed by the. How Denver do you Broncos. get arrested for that? And he was the the Walter Payton Man of the Year, or whatever that was. Yeah, the, he still should be. Yeah. <laughs> the fuck who cares he fucked a prostitute who cares what does that have to do with him playing football eugene robinson was the guy god name. damn it dude they should like look i feel like there should be morale platoons in the military mm -hmm. supposed to, platoons of whores male and female whores if you want to suck dick or get your dick sucked you should sure. have that opportunity on the government's dime it's a very tough job right <laughs> come on and then in football obviously like you're doing People think that these guys are just, oh, they're just fucking overpaid, fucking whatever. They work really fucking hard. Yeah. They work way harder than our fat asses do. Yeah. They need uh, to get their dick sucked. Yeah. They need to get their dick sucked, release a little pressure. Like, you want them to win, right? Yeah. You want your team to fucking win, let them get their dick sucked. <laughs> on a ghost bed. Exactly. On a ghost bed. From ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Let's hire this guy. Yeah. We should, we should hire you. <laughs> uh, you're, you definitely don't have any content like this on your YouTube channel. <laughs> um, no. No. Uh, you I've, got a podcast got some... though. We started. We uh, we started a podcast. It's a little bit in more, much more in line with what you guys are doing. Oh, good. I'm kind of. I kind of get sick of playing the PG guy on YouTube all the mm -hmm. time, but I have to. Yeah. So now, now we got this off the husk podcast where we can say whatever the hell we want. That's to, what it's called, it's off great. the husk. It's fantastic. That's a great off name. the husk, dude. Okay. Off the husk. That's a great name for a podcast. Nice. Yeah, it's going. Check that out. Um, I was I perusing through your YouTube channel. And, uh, man, it, it, it's fascinating that you've grown to a half a million oh, subscribers in it. I just thought of a really fucking funny story that I wanted to tell. And I didn't even I didn't realize he was from Minnesota until this morning. Sure. So this morning, Adrian Peterson was on ESPN. Uh -huh. 
from his house using using Zoom like everybody is. The right? gr- one of the greatest Vikings of all time. Yeah. Yeah. So I heard yeah. his uh, like he's in the middle of responding to a question from one of the one of the ESPN guys, and I hear his kid talking in the background. I'm like, uh oh. What's going to happen here? Is Adrian Peterson about to have a relapse? What's yeah. happening here? I got nervous. Yeah. I didn't know if he was going to crack his kid in the head, but he kept a complete <laughs> straight face. So, good. Really? Sorry to interrupt, but that seemed important. Yeah, again, since you're high talk fan. with Dan Holloway. That's not high talk. That's um, normal talk. No, not even close to it. You a big AP well, fan? I think anybody would think of that. You got you to worry for the kid, right? You got to no, worry oh, for no. the kid's welfare. No, I'm worried for AP being able to play football. I don't care about that kid. Yeah. <laughs> Is he, eventually you're going to be at one of his birthday parties dan i know <laughs> i know i'm going to show up and be like hey where's the switches man i need to hit some of these kids <laughs> give me that fucking cake if exactly. you showed up if you showed up to a large enough child's birthday party and you just started reprimanding one of the kids everyone would think that that's your kid probably you know what i mean yeah. then you can just cruise through the rest of the party and no one suspects you until got, the actual parents show up yeah yeah, yeah. uh how did you get a half a million subscribers everybody wants to know that everybody wants to crack the code on youtube um, did you just start posting videos and then it just magically happened? You were like, wow, shit, right? I guess we should, we should keep doing it. That's pretty much it. I mean, you saw before this whole thing started, I don't know how the, the audio and the computer and the zoom, I, my wife sets that stuff up so that I can do this. So when I started the channel, it, it was everything with my cell phone, uh, to begin with, you know, and then things started getting a little bigger and taking off and, and people wanted to see more. And I decided to do a little bit more so i had to get the camera that would go with it and it just kept snowballing and going and going and now it's now it's wide open i think one of the big things like for me is i I get told all the time well you should fly a drone you should make it more cinematic you should make it more like a movie and that's not what i do i'm a farmer you know i don't want to do that shit i just want to carry the camera around and have it be real so that's the main thing is keep it real because i I, i'm not out there making up shit that doesn't happen Mm -hmm. just so i got a good storyline right and, and I think that's a big key to it is just keep it real. Yeah, you can do stuff to try and make it exciting and get people to watch the video. But for the most part, you want to keep it real. And and now we got this platform built up to a certain point. You know, in the last couple of weeks here, I've, I've gained a ton of subscribers because I was pushing real hard. Hey, give me the half a million and, a, and I'll donate. We're going to write a $10,000 check to the Farm Rescue Organization, which uh, essentially what they are is the uh, – like the red cross for farmers. Mm -hmm. If farmers have something that comes up, say, you know, grandpa has a heart attack in the middle of planting or the middle of harvest. And, and without grandpa, they can't get this crop in farm rescue. will send volunteers there with a lot of times with donated machinery coming from like John Deere works very closely with them and they'll show up and they'll harvest that crop for that family. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Deere saw (laughs) what I was doing. They said, you know what, if you get those subscriber numbers up, we'll donate too. So we're, we're going to do it. We're going to do it either way. It was a fun way, you know, just to have fun with it, try to gain some subscribers. But even if I didn't gain a one, you know, we're writing that check anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, so we're going to we're going to donate 10 grand to Farm Rescue Organization. Um, we've worked with Farm Veteran Coalition in the past, which is a, an organization that helps veterans with a, a, a farming interest get into some sort of farming, whether it be some small time whatever organic or, or regenerative farming that they want to get to or, or maybe they want to get in and go big. Farmer Veteran Coalition's worked with us to promote them, and we've donated to them too. So I, I feel like we got this platform built up now, and I can continue to show what I do on my farm, but I also got to do good for for the industry that I love, right? Because it, as cliche as it sounds, again, that's the reason I started this whole deal. That's that's why I'm sitting here today talking to you guys. Any interest in, uh, in growing cannabis up there? I know it's medically legal now, but I also know that Minnesota just – got rid of 3.2% beer not too long ago. So it's not exactly the most progressive state when it comes to shit like that. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, you, I'm curious about that as well. M- Minnesota, you'd be surprised, like the, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul area, and then we got the Iron Range up in mm. uh, northeast Minnesota. There's a, mm. there's a lot of, uh, you know what, I'll call them liberals. Mm. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, if it's legal and there's an opportunity there and there's a market, hey, I'll grow whatever. You know, I mean, we, we've got, we can grow hemp now. Mm -hmm. The problem with hemp, and we looked into it five years ago before it was federally legal. We looked into it because it was legal in the state of Minnesota, but essentially the banks that you work with and the companies you work with say, Hey, hemp is a federally illegal crop. Uh, If you grow that, we're not going to work with you. Mm -hmm. So that pretty well put us out of that idea at the time. But now that it's legal everywhere, I mean, the acres have gone tenfold and, and it's kind of back to uh, the processors. I mean, 
all of a sudden there's 10 times more hemp than what we really have a market for. So there just isn't any money in it right now. Right. I mean, the money is in being able to produce uh, full spectrum cannabinoid CBD right now, liquid CBD. A lot of people yeah. are like, there's a lot of like garbage on the market right now. A lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that either like, there's a lot of it that's made of hemp seeds, which doesn't have any cannabinoids in it at right. all. There's, there's stuff that has actual THC, which is the active ingredient weed mm-hmm. in it. So, you know, that's uh yeah it's a it's a it's a big market but yeah you're right there's it, there's so many niches even within that that one market it's hard to know I guess especially with a farm your size when to turn off maybe a guaranteed money maker and venture out into a new fucking thing right because then a lot of times you're gonna have a big investment if you need different machinery mm-hmm. nothing is cheap there so you may you may be looking at you know some really high dollars just to get the machinery to be mm-hmm. able to do it that's interesting I, w- I wouldn't even thought of that to be honest yeah. With you. Um, since you are from Minnesota, we're gonna we're gonna ask you how uh, Ilhan Omar. How did she get elected in your state? <laughs> um, I got some ideas. I mean, you go down into the, the Twin Cities area, and it, I mean, it's as liberal as it gets. And Is you it guys really? were talking about the the diversity. It's very yeah, a lot of liberal arts students. I mean, it's uh, they call if you're in Minnesota, maybe the rest of the country doesn't know this, but we call ourselves Little California. I mean, we're it's a it's a pretty liberal state when you get to the the uh, you know the urban areas. I did not know that, man. I had no idea about that. Uh, and then, our, our, obviously, the last Minnesota question I have to ask you because we don't have too many people from Minnesota on the show. You and Jack Mandeville are the only two that I know. Derek White. Derek White is from Minnesota. No he's, shit. Yeah, he's from St. Paul. God damn it! I didn't know <clears> that. <throat> uh, Prince, are you a Prince fan? Have you been to Paisley uh, Park? I haven't been to Paisley Park. You know, there's a lot of people that are diehard Prince fans that were just crushed when this guy died. I'm and one of I, them. You, I, I, But I wasn't going to walk around and pretend like I was at this huge loss because some guy whose music I never listened to died. There you go. Mm. What do you listen? What do you listen to? Are you a country guy? You, you mentioned God's country earlier. I was surprised to hear you say Illinois in the Midwest states. According to Blake Shelton, it's Georgia. But uh, hey, man. I think God's country is wherever everybody's from, right? You can, God country is pretty subjective to whoever's saying it, but I mean, I, I listen honestly to a little, little bit of everything. I can't stand the mainstream poppy shit. Actually, uh, some of your guys' stuff recently turned me on to Tim Montana. That's who I've been rocking yeah, nonstop lately. I just can't get enough of his style. He's great, man. We love Tim Montana. We're big fans of his over here. I mean, he's like uh, right on the line between country and Southern rock, I guess. Yeah. Kind of jumps back. It's like a, almost like a, if Kid Rock is a rock leaning Southern rock person, mm-hmm. then I would say Tim Montana is probably a country leaning Southern rock person. It's funny, man. Kid Rock switched. He was a fucking DJ back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I know, right? Rapper. Yeah. Uh, he switched. Yeah, he he's... made a right. He made a good decision. Yeah, he made, and millions of dollars. Yeah, he's good at both. Uh, now to the point in the show, Zach, we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who's helped you, inspired you to become the person and or farmer you are today. Uh, couldn't be a man or a woman. Who'd you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Shit, I, I I wish I had thought of this. I didn't even think of this. Uh man, I'll probably I probably give it to my dad. Um, and I don't know if he's ever heard the podcast or not, but you know what? The the guy raised me to be who I am, and I and I'm on this farm because he's here. And uh, I watched him bust his ass and was damn near broke for 10, 15 years of his life. And I was a young kid and 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 never really knew it. You know, but um, he he dug this place out of a hole and now we have what we have today. And um, he's out there every day working side by side with me. So, again, as cliche as it sounds, that's the reality. It's real. And no, that's, that's who I'll give it to. That's great. What's his name? Uh, Nate. Nate. Nathan. Yeah, yep. Nathan. Big Nate. I don't know big if Nate. he's big or not, but I like Big Nate. <laughs> it rolls off the tongue easily. Uh, no, that look, it's fantastic, man. Um, and, and look, we greatly appreciate you being on the show. This is a, an industry, again, like we said at the top, that we don't really know anything about. Um, and this was a, uh, a first-class education mm-hmm. today for, for the both of us. Um, is there anything else out there that uh, your day-to-day dumb American uh, who doesn't think about the farming industry should be more considerate about when they go to the grocery store or go to the farmer's market? I would say the one one of the points that I like to try and get across is, you know, you hear so much shit about, hey, don't eat GMOs and everything is soaked in in pesticides and everything is, you know, synthetic fertilizers and everything's poisoned. And 
I mean, the, the farmers out here, myself, my family, yeah, we use that stuff and we have reasons for doing that. I mean, we, we have real legitimate scientific management reasons why we use that stuff. And, and we're not, we're not out there pouring this shit on as thick as we can because it's expensive as hell for us. You know, we're using the, these things as management tools. And, you know, if I, if I poison my water and I poison my soil and I do things that, that isn't right for the food supply of this country, that comes back on me way before it comes back on any of the fuckers sitting in these cities that are talking shit on this industry. So we care, right? It's my, it's, it, it's my family that lives out here. We yeah. make our livelihood off the soil. We're using the water. We're swimming in the lakes. I'm drinking the water straight out of the well. I mean, we, we care and we have reasons for doing what we do. That's awesome, man. Uh, wh- hey, tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Uh, YouTube would be my main one, uh, Millennial Farmer. Millennial is a tough word to spell, so some of some of them are going to have to Google that first. Uh, <laughs> and Instagram and Facebook. I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L. There we That's go. Spell yeah. There we go. Two, two L's, two N's. Yeah. And same thing, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, some of my stuff is MN Millennial Farmer because it started out with the MN. Cause I didn't want to take, I didn't want to double up on somebody else's name when I started, but I've passed him by a long ways now. So fuck it. I'm taking millennial farmer. There it is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, for Zach, and Anthony, D'Anthony, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the drinking bros. Good night, everyone.